Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. A wave of progressive politicians have been elected across Latin America in what has been described as a pink tide, a turn to the left. Have a look at this map and you'll see exactly what I mean. This new wave started back in 2018 in Mexico with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Since then, Honduras, Panama, Guyana, Suriname, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, and most recently Chile have welcomed left-wing leaders. So what does this mean for the region and the world? Well, today's guests are going to help us answer that question. Hello, Isabel, Oliver and Teresa. It's so nice to have all three of you here. Great brains to tackle this question. Isabel, please introduce yourself to our audience around the world. Hi, I'm Isabel Castillo. I'm a political scientist and a researcher at the Catholic University in Chile and at the Center for Conflict and Cohesion Studies uh, here in Santiago. Oliver, tell the stream audience who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Oliver Sunhul. I'm a professor of international relations at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And welcome back to Teresa. Teresa, please introduce yourself. Remind our audience who you are and what you do. Well, my name is Teresa Bo. I'm a Latin American correspondent for Al Jazeera English. All right. And you, audience, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you are very much part of this conversation. The comment section is now live. Jump into the comment section. If you've got questions or comments for our panel, they're very happy to answer them. All right. Let's start, Teresa, with Pink Tide. As far as you're concerned, when you're down on the ground in Latin America, what does it look like? How would you describe it in more detail for our audience? Well, if I have to look back and we talk about uh, a pink tide and, and if we talk about what it is about uh, reforming the region as a whole, is looking back to when abortion was legalized in Argentina. It was a very long night for us waiting for a vote in Senate. And you could see thousands and thousands and thousands of people on the streets waiting uh, for abortion to le be legalized in this country. And it's not only to be legalized, this abortion is something that was already happening in Argentina. Mostly poor women were affected. And let's not forget that this is a country of Pope Francis, of the influence the Catholic Church has had in uh, different Argentinian governments, in Congress, in the Senate. Uh, so when abortion was legalized, it's like this, this first, uh, you know, it was very moving to see how grassroots movements in the region and how that inspired uh, other parts uh, of uh, Latin America as a whole. And what happened after that, you know, the whole debate in Colombia, in Mexico, in Chile. So uh, when, when we talk about being tied aside for, from economic policies, from center left governments, I'm also talking about um, rights, about rights in the region for minorities, for women. And that's something that, that it's been very, very, very exciting for me to watch. Oliver, I see you nodding. Please articulate that nod. Well, I think we certainly have seen uh, um, progress when it comes to uh, minority rights, women's rights, uh, etc. At the same time, I think it's important to point out that parts of the pink tide are also profoundly conservative, sort of an old yes. school nationalist, left wing uh, social conservative, uh, like many of the iconic figures of Latin America's left, uh, Morales, Chavez, uh, Fidel Castro, were all you know, pretty homophobic. Uh, and, and there are some of these which are part of this new iteration of the pink tide, like Castillo in Peru, who's fairly conservative. But I do agree that there's a new generation of leaders, like Boric, for example, in Chile, which are clearly, I think, have the potential, particularly if they do well, to uh, redefine what it means to be uh, you know, progressive and, and uh, in Latin America. Mm, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I, I'm just going to bring in Isabel here because definitely when Gabriel Boric was elected, people were, whoa, a student activist now becomes a leader of Chile. That was a shock. Was it a shock for Chile? Did you see that coming? Well, we could see it coming. Um, the first round was a bit of a surprise because the runner up was uh, a far right candidate. Uh, so that was somewhat unexpected, but uh, for a while, Boric had had the lead. Um, but it was all, I mean, if you had uh, looked five years ago, no one would have expected this. It partly has to do with uh, the social uprising that began in late 2019. That sort of uh, shifted all politics of the country. And I think uh, it's part of the reason why uh, Boric um, ascended. And I think he's a great example of this new left as um, 
Tres uh, and um, sorry, not Tres. Oliver. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Oliver were saying um, the things like uh, how they relate to the feminist movement and to feminist agendas. One of the things that clearly divides um, different brands of left uh, left wing governments uh, in the region. Isabel, allow me to be trivial for one moment because I'm going to show a picture on my laptop. So this is uh, Gabrielle Boric. <laughs> and I was talking about yeah. this picture with my producer. My producer, I was like, he's just got tats on. He's got tattoos. Is that yeah. it? And he's like, yep, that's it. But I've never seen a leader with tattoos. Now I'm sure that our audience will then stand as in tweets with all the leaders who have tattoos. But I think there's something in this picture, although it seems quite lighthearted, that tells you a lot about where Chile is, because there are many other countries around the world who, if you're 50, you're still considered young to be a leader. Yeah. Yeah, no, he I, just turned 36. He yeah. doesn't wear a tie. That's one of his things. He didn't even wear a tie to um, when he took office. Uh, and he has a much more direct relationship with um, with uh, citizenry. Like he mm. less so now that he's uh, uh, taken office, but he's often on Twitter and interacting with people. Um, and a lot of people feel that there are crowds uh, of uh, lots of children and families waiting for him to get home, to be able to speak to him. So it's not just uh, the image, the, ta the tattoos are, uh, or the lack of a tie, but there's a clearly more horizontal relationship between him and uh, the population that what we are used to, uh, especially with this last uh, government of Piñera, who is actually twice his age. So it's a, there's a big gap there. I think that the generation gap between Boric and the rest of the presidents, even though they are progressive in Latin America, is fascinating, mostly because of what we have you know, heard him say. I mean, what he said, for example, about condemning human rights abuses wherever they are, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, and even Cuba. This is something where most governments in the region, if you want to compare it with Lula da Silva in Brazil or Alberto Fernandez, they have been reluctant, in a way, to condemn Venezuela when protesters were killed, uh, among other things. So Boric has been very, very serious about human rights, for example, about macroeconomic policies in the country. One big, big challenge uh, for uh, Latin American governments have been stability, economic stability, especially, for example, here in Argentina or in Venezuela, where we've seen was, you know, the millions of people living the country because of the enormous economic crisis in that country. Well, Argentina is another problem. Lots of macroeconomic problems. Inflation rates are soaring right now here in uh, in Argentina as a whole. And Boric has says that keeping, you know, economic stability, uh, preserving the macroeconomy of the country is also a priority for his administration. And I think that's very, very interesting because, you know, it's a, it's a new left, as you said it before. So we'll have mm. to see what he can do with that. Oliver, I want to play you a video comment. This comes from Martin. He sent this in to us a few hours ago. Have a listen. He has a different explanation about the pink tide. And then as soon as you finish listening, I'd love your response. Here's Martin. We can consider that since 2019, different social movements has been like empowering a new political cycle. And this political cycle, I will not uh, make the mistake to call it a second pink tide because it represents different flavors of politics that are centered in like social movements that are against the patriarchy, the extractivism, and like social injustice. I will call this something like a multicolored people's tide. Yeah, I think he, he's pointing to uh, several important differences when we compare this new pink tide to the leaders who emerged in the 2000s. And I think two issues stand out. The first is uh, the environment. Uh, there's clearly now, I mean, Boric is, is very concerned about environmental issues, very different from uh, past uh, progressive or left governments uh, in Latin America. We see the same with the leading presidential candidate in Colombia, Petro, who's in a, in a way an environmentalist as well in the Workers' Party in uh, Brazil, despite not really having prioritized this issue, uh, will clearly embrace, if they win, uh, a more environmentalist uh, policy. The other issue is that, uh, yes, Boric has a very uh, different background and, and sort of grew, in, grew up in social movements, uh, which uh, occurred within the context of, of democracy, whereas past leaders 
uh, in Latin America who came to power in the 2000s, many of them were engaged in the fight for democracy. Uh, Lula, for example, uh, you yeah. know, became a politician during the dictatorship, very different political context. And of course, uh, uh, you know, issues like women's rights were not really on the agenda 20 years ago. And that is quite a challenge for some leaders who are seeking to engage conservative voters as well. Lula, for example, has just picked or is likely to pick and, and uh, now in, uh, present in the next days a conservative uh, you know, vice presidential candidate. So um, he may also face some limits <laughs> when it comes to you know, uh, pr you know, uh, prioritizing these issues, which points to the fact that countries like Chile and Argentina perhaps are a bit more progressive as societies than other countries like Mexico, Colombia and Brazil. Teresa, I'm just thinking of this history of the Pink Tide. This is almost Pink Tide, the sequel, because in the late 90s, the early 2000s, there was another Pink Tide. I'm thinking about the differences. I'm not the only one. Valentina sent us this comment a little bit earlier. Have a listen and then your thoughts, please. There's not only one left side now in Chile. There's different le types of lefts. There's also political parties, but political movements that are representative of the left-wing uh, parties now here in Chile. So uh, they think different. They do things differently. So it's very interesting to see if things are going to work out for the government. And people do have high expectations about what's coming. They are positive of this. But as we can tell among history, uh, things don't always go as they wish. So we're going to have to see if the things go like people want or there's going to be some kinds of disappointment within the government that has been now elected. Well, I, I think that the big difference between what happened back in the early 2000s with the government of Hugo Chavez at the time, Nestor Kirchner in Argentina, Lula, you know, it, it's a completely different region in a way. At that time, this whole pink tide, if, if you want it that way, um, was led by Hugo Chavez's so-called socialist revolution. Venezuela was leading at the time in Latin America. Uh, Venezuela was assisting governments in the regions. There were um, regional alliances being made all the time that supported each other. What, what I'm seeing right now is uh, first of all, the disappointment in a way that happened with Venezuela, the enormous economic crisis that happened. We're talking about a country that suffered around a million percent inflation rate that forced around five million people out of the country. So the whole disenchantment with what happened in Venezuela is not happening right now. So I'm seeing at least uh, in the region and in several governments in the region, lots of pragmatism. I'm seeing pragmatism in Alberto Fernandez here in Argentina, that he stresses the need for Argentina to negotiate with the International Monetary Fund for the risk of being completely isolated from the rest of the world and Argentina being left from international market, the risk is much bigger. So I, I think that while, while leaders uh, back in the early 2000s were anti-American in a way or challenging the United States, well, I think the leadership right now is much more willing to engage, to engage with the United States, to engage with superpowers, and I think that, in a way, it makes it interesting. But, of course, it doesn't satisfy everyone. We're seeing right now, for example, demonstrations by the left in Buenos Aires that are condemning the government. But we're also seeing protests but with, from, from uh, the coalition, from the ruling coalition uh, that is the leftist side of that coalition, that it's also on the streets demanding that austerity measures are not implemented. So, of course, there's going to be lots of challenges. But among the leadership, at least, I'm seeing lots of pragmatism when dealing with everyday problems. Isabel, if, if, I, just, uh, if I can jump oh, in. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Isabel, you go first. <laughs> Oliver, you go second. And okay. YouTube is going to go third because I've got some really juicy questions for you. Isabel, go ahead. Yes, great. Now, I would add a couple of uh, points to this comparison with the early 2000s. So first is the, the economy. So in the early 2000s, there was these, uh, these uh, okay. leftist government cool. came to power when there was a commodities boom. So. Um, all, yes. all of our economies are based in commodities, so there was a, a lot of money, resources to expand social policies, so that also facilitated uh, their success. And I think a second difference now is that, as opposed to what um, was Chavez or Correa in, in Ecuador or Bolivia, where they changed their, their um, constitutions and they were generally popular and had big um, support um, through some tangling with the rules as well in, in Congress, now, all of these are very tenuous coalitions. 
So Boric doesn't have a majority in Congress. Um, if Petro is elected, they just had the uh, 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 legislative elections, and he won't have a majority. Lula is also entering in coalition for the same reason. Uh, in Argentina, uh, the current has also lost the majority in Congress. So uh, all of these co coalitions are quite weak, and that will also partly limit what they can do, but okay. uh, presents quite a different scenario from um, compared to the early 2000s. Oliver. I think that in addition to the much tougher economic environment, uh, in some, it, I sometimes feel, you know, talking to people across the region, that uh, people are also growing a bit tired of the extreme polarization that has shaped the political debate. Mm -hmm. At least in Brazil, this is very clear. People just want to sort of get leaders to, to, to get things done, uh, to deliver uh, good public policies. And Lula's decision to bring in uh, a, a conservative on his presidential ticket kind of shows that he's clearly, he clearly believes that this cycle of extreme polarization is over. Mm -hmm. Uh, which has shaped politics in the last years. So I do, I tend to agree. I think there's quite some potential for pragmatism also because it's just such a difficult economic time. Uh, it's the region that has probably suffered most in the world uh, during the pandemic, a tremendous reversal in the areas of public health, public education. So I think people are really focusing now on issues like uh, inequality, bread and butter issues, reduction of poverty. Okay. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that explains the rise of the left. Oliver, uh, Tiago is watching you right now, and Tiago says he's from Brazil. I would like to know what you guys think, Oliver, <laughs> about the chances of Lula turning back to the presidency. What do you think? I, well, I think he's, he's leading the polls, and I think uh, his, his gestures are clearly showing that he'd like to attract centrist voters. He, he likes to project a big tent alternative to Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, I think it's going to be much closer than many people believe. Uh, there's a lot of doubt about whether Bolsonaro would accept defeat or whether we'll see something similar mm -hmm. to uh, January 6th in the United States. But he's Lula is clearly the January the 6th in the United the States? That's not good. That was an yeah, insurrection. Yeah, I think um, we have very similar rhetoric about, you know, uh, from Bolsonaro questioning wow. the legitimacy of the voting system. But I would still expect right now, looking at the polls, I think Lula clearly is a favorite to return after 20 years. To back to the presidency. Uh, another YouTube question. This one I'm going to put to you, Isabel. Will Davis says, so this conversation about the pink tide, it depends on the kind of left we're talking about. A left that wants to redistribute wealth to the bottom is useful. A left that just wants to put more diverse people in charge of a failing system is no good. That's Will Davis's perspective. What's yours, Isabel? I think they're both complementary. I mean, part of the demand uh, here in Chile, but I don't think it's in any way exclusive to the country, is to uh, renew political elites. Um, uh, Colombia, I think, has a similar demand. We don't want the same uh, people in power, so there's this strong anti-establishment, and uh, this generational change here in Chile points uh, to that as well. People want to see new faces and hopefully new pr different practices. And, of course, a company that would structural reform. But I think um, people are very um, uh, distrustful of, of traditional politicians. So I think that bringing in new people is, is a, uh, is, tends to be well-valued here in Chile, definitely. And I think it's, a, it's a not rare. I think we see that in other countries. Yes, I want to push us on in the last five minutes of our discussion into what the impact of this pink tie could be. Will policies change? Will different things happen for the people on the ground? Angela Vergara is a professor at the California State University, uh, and she's looking at extractive industries and how a, maybe a different approach to those extractive industries may have an impact on what changes in each of the countries that have a, less, a leftist leader. Here's Angela. She explains it so much better than I just did. Here she is. One of the biggest challenges that new leftist government face today in Latin America is how to respond to the environmental consequences of extractivist industry. And I think this is particularly relevant today because if in the past, what we can call the first generation of pink tide leaders, they respond to this by nationalizing extractivist industry and by using that money to finance social services and infrastructure projects 
project. Um, today, this becomes a little bit more complicated because the evident environmental cost of that and the impact on indigenous communities. So you know what I'm thinking, Oliver, is if you have a wealth of fossil fuels, but your philosophy, your politics tells you that you shouldn't be using them, you should be protecting the environment, what do you do? What funds your social policies, Oliver? Well, in, uh, for example, uh, in Colombia, Petro is clearly saying he wants to move away from fossil fuels, from extractive industries, wants to boost uh, tourism, for example. Uh, that will, of course, be a challenge because there's a lot of short-term needs and one way to address them is to fall back to the old developing uh, development models. In Chile, too, I think, uh, many will watch closely whether the transition, the economic transition that uh, Boric is proposing will work out. Because when we look at other left-wing governments in the region, there has been, they've been clinging on to traditional ways of, of doing business. So I think a lot will depend on how Chile will perform, which in many ways I think could inspire others or look at Chile and say, this is not how I want to uh, go about uh, developing the economy. So I think that's definitely the country to, to watch out for in the next months and years. Isabel, I am wondering if what is happening in Chile right now is seen as a positive development, a positive change in politics. Here's Thea with quite a complicated question that I would love you to have a listen to and respond to. These governments are coming to power on the heels of Latin America's worst recession since independence. So for the past 200 years, Latin America never experienced as bad a set of economic conditions as it did um, during these pandemic years. So that's one major constraint. A second is that most of these governments um, will govern under conditions of what we can call divided government, meaning that they do not have majorities or actually anywhere near close to majorities in the legislatures of their countries. That means that in order to get any legislation passed, they will need to dialogue, negotiate with, um, and even ally with centrist or even right of center parties in some cases in order to get any legislation passed. So you have a young leader in Chile um, yeah. as a student activist. Well, so much promise. What will be delivered? Yeah. Well, that's a million dollar question, right? Um, so yes, Thea said, and we have uh, discussed before, he doesn't have a majority, but um, I think there is a window of, of opportunity, uh, partly because we had the social uprising, we are in the middle of a constitutional process. So some at least, some elites are uh, aware that um, changes are needed uh, because uh, there are demands that need to be met, right? Uh, so there is a, there's an opportunity to do that, uh, and and Boric has uh, pushed that uh, some forms of structural change in his program, but also recognizing that he needs to speak to big business. Uh, so there's this there's a balance there that is mm -hmm. under construction. They're okay. uh, carrying out big dialogue, All right. uh, and to do that with a focus on protecting the environment, pushing new industries such as uh, green um, energies, for example, sure. uh, and with a feminist focus. So for example, in terms of uh, recovering employment, they've uh, pointed to uh, focusing on women's employment, which uh, was hit the hardest uh, All right, by the pandemic. I want to go back to the map that I started with at the very beginning. So I'm just going to put that up. Teresa, I'm in the last one minute of the show. I'm just looking at this pink tide, this pink wave, however you want to think about it. For the region, what does that mean for the rest of the world in the last 30 seconds of today's show? Well, I think uh, it's, it's an experiment in a way, mostly Chile to see what Boric can do, what he can achieve with lots of conservative forces against him. And that's something that we've seen in the region as a whole. We've seen progressive governments in the region fighting against more conservative forces and allying, in a way, with conservative mm -hmm. forces to be able to reach some type of an agreement. And, and going back to the whole extractivism sure. issue, the big challenge for many countries is the inequality, the poverty that continues to exist here, the amount of people that depend on the state and how those states are able to make Thank a you, transition. Teresa. Uh, to try to, to change the situation here. Thank you, Teresa and Oliver and Isabel for helping us understand the pink wave across Latin America. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.